1914, the battle to subdue the hill country of the North Island had barely begun. Yet in that very same year, the men who were struggling against nature on the bush frontier pulled out. Towns like Hunterville gave up many of their most able-bodied young men. For on the 4th of August 1914, war of a totally different kind had been declared in Europe. And almost every community in New Zealand poured its manpower into that new conflict on the other side of the world. At first, it was just a glorious adventure, a chance to fight for king and empire. Everyone knew that it would all be over by Christmas, and there was a rush to volunteer. 60,000 joined up. Within 10 days of the outbreak of war, the first New Zealanders were on the way. During the next four years, nearly half the nation's available men were to follow. For such a tiny country, it was an enormous sacrifice. New Zealanders soon earned a reputation as fearless fighters in Palestine, on Gallipoli, and on the battlefields of France and Belgium. Nearly 3,000 New Zealand lives were lost on Gallipoli alone. At Passchendaele in Belgium, more than 600 were killed in just a few hours. In only one month, October 1917, the New Zealand division suffered nearly 8,000 casualties. This terrible slaughter has left its own New Zealand landmark on the face of Belgium. The list of those who didn't come back was staggering and Hunterville was like all the other towns in the country, large and small. By 1915, after the slaughter at Gallipoli, the early patriotic fervor had given place to bitterness. Finally, on November the 11th, 1918, the nightmare ended. Tens of thousands of men began to return home. New Zealand decided its returning heroes deserved more than a rousing welcome. The nation agreed that every returning serviceman should be entitled to a few hectares of the land he'd fought to defend. Where those hectares would be and who'd get them was to be decided by ballot. But it was a matter of pure luck whether your name came up or not. Some men's never did, and they waited in vain for years. For those whose names did come up, though, one thing was certain. Most of the accessible land in the North Island had already been taken up and developed, so that the land allocated to ex-servicemen was sure to be out in the Waplops. Often, by river was the only way to get there. There were no roads. The new battlefront was in tougher hill country than anyone had yet tackled in New Zealand. But travel up the Whanganui River by boat was only a start. Now, you had to follow the rough six-foot track into the interior a journey that might take another week.
Everything you'd be likely to need over the next few months, you'd have to take with you. Your food, your tent, and your tools. Finally, even the six-foot track would peter out, a sign that you must be getting close to your own piece of land. You'd have to guess where its boundaries lay. There were no signposts, no fences, no man-made marks of any kind. Only the forest itself, and before you could make a farm, that had to go. It was a daunting prospect, but an efficient technique had been developed for burning bush that was damp and dense. What the pioneers learned to do was slash the undergrowth and fell the smaller trees. They called it underscrubbing. These trees are just about as big as they'd tackle with an axe. If there was enough underscrub, though, and if it was dry, the fire would be hot enough to kill all the bigger stuff, turning the tallest timber trees into ghostly black stumps. It would take a man all winter and most of the following spring to clear about 20 hectares, so that when the crucial day came, he'd make very sure indeed that conditions were just right before he lit that match. The underscrub had to be tinder dry, the day hot, clear and fine with a steady breeze blowing in the right direction. That usually meant either February or early March. If the wind dropped or changed direction or a storm came up over the ridge, it could be disastrous. A half-hearted fire would produce an incomplete burn the big trees wouldn't be killed and there'd be no underscrub left to carry a second fire. After a lonely year of hard work, a disaster like that was enough to drive many a man mad. It was an exciting business and even before the ground had cooled, the pioneer farmer would be out scattering his grass seed between the smouldering stumps. Where the bush had been, now there was grass and clover, food for the first few sheep. It was a modest start, but it showed that even the roughest land could be broken in. All that was needed was hard work and determination, or so everybody thought. Hope was particularly high when the bush pioneer set off for town with his first wool clip the fruit of a whole year's toil slung across the back of a single pack horse. But it was enough to pay his mortgage and to keep him in supplies for another year. Despite the awful isolation and the terribly hard work, things seemed to go pretty well for a year or two at least. The pioneers had time to build simple houses using 
pit saw and timber. Some of them brought in their women folk. The Whanganui River, they called it New Zealand's Rhine, became quite a busy highway. Inland from Whanganui and New Plymouth, remote little communities grew up. As fire consumed more and more forest and prices for wool continued to rise, the future for everyone in the hill country seemed full of promise. But it was a false dawn. Man hadn't yet won his battle with nature. Indeed, a counterattack was imminent. In the end, that counterattack was devastating. Within a few years, the little townships in the hills had been abandoned and the settlers' homes left to wind, weather, and borer. Sixty years later, it's hard to realize that down there in the valley of the Fongamomena was once a real live settlement. It wasn't a big one, but it was big enough to have its own school and post office store sports ground. It was called Aotuhia. The people who settled here were completely defeated. Even today, not a soul lives in the area. Who'd believe that the main street of a township once ran beside the river there? there's a standard Ministry of Works bridge. It leads nowhere. Logs jammed beneath the bridge show how high the floodwaters rise. But it takes more than a few floods to drive out tough settler families. Two things made those pioneers turn their backs on our two here. One was half the world away. In Britain in 1921, the market for both meat and wool collapsed. The other, though, was right here on these hillsides, because without realizing it, those bush farmers had sown the seeds of an ecological disaster. What really defeated those early settlers was ignorance. They didn't know enough about the country itself. They thought the dense bush meant the land was fertile, but they were wrong. Nearly all its fertility was tied up in the vegetation, not in the thin layer of soil. When they burned the forest, much of that fertility went up in smoke. The rest was reduced to a light, fluffy ash, and the first decent rain washed most of that away, too. What fertility there was left was sufficient to give grass and clover a start, nothing more. Scrub and fern took over. That first green flush of fertility had been a fool's paradise. There was another area of New Zealand, though, that had nobody fooled. Generations of soldiers abused the North Island Central Plateau as a training ground. Right from the start, everyone realized it wasn't much use for anything else. It's a little bleak up here, but it's not impossible country. 
a handful of pioneers had tried to farm the plateau long before the Whanganui Hill Country was tackled, but they failed. And they failed because no matter how open and easy this land was, their sheep and cattle just wasted away and died. The farmers called these symptoms bush sickness. They'd no idea what caused it, but they didn't have to look very far for clues. This is all volcanic country. Around here, the Earth's crust is pretty thin, and it's hot. Recently, though, we've managed to tap some of that heat. But when a real head of steam blows up, there's nothing anybody can do about it, not even the Ministry of Works. The last large-scale explosive eruption occurred where Lake Taupo is now, little more than a thousand years ago. It was probably seen by the first men in New Zealand. And at that time, showers of hot pumice rained down out of the skies and blanketed millions of hectares. Wherever the early settlers found that Taupo ash, they had bush sickness. It's no wonder the plateau got such a bad name. The irony, though, is that east of Lake Taupo, it's as flat as a pancake, and there was no dense forest to clear. Since the last layer of pumice was deposited, nothing would grow here but scrub. There was obviously something wrong with the soil, and men turned their backs on the pumice country almost from the beginning, until, that is, an Auckland real estate agent, Edward Earl Vale, came along. Bale had such blind faith in the plateau that he took on 21,000 hectares at Broadlands between Taupo and Rotorua. By 1912, with the help of Maori labor, he was breaking it in and had 250 hectares in crops. The key to Vale's survival was the fact that he grew root crops and fed them to cattle. Other farmers had tried to graze sheep amongst the scrub. Vale tried to increase the value of his property. He conducted a long campaign to have the government build a railway from Rotorua to Taupo through his estate at Broadlands. Year after year, Vale pestered the politicians in Wellington until finally, in 1928, they agreed to make a start. But they didn't get very far. Today, this is all that remains of that project, just a few miles of cutting and filling. The reputation of the plateau as a hostile wilderness was still far too strong. And in any case, just around the corner, there was something that was to stop all development in its tracks. The Great Depression. There had been other depressions, but nothing like the disaster that struck in 1929. The economy collapsed. Salaries and wages were slashed by government decree. In the cities, there were ugly confrontations with police. The unemployed marched on Parliament in their thousands. A bewildered government found it easier to provide work in the countryside than to create jobs in town, where factories and offices were closing down. The so-called slave camps were set up, where men cleared scrub and planted trees for a few shillings a week. The official policy was simple, no work, no pay. Relief workers built roads and laid out golf courses. They dug tunnels and drains. This was the darkest period in New Zealand's economic history, especially for those in the cities.
desperate poverty was nothing new for the small farmer, especially those who'd taken on hill country after the First World War. The depression affected them, of course, just as it did everybody else. They couldn't afford to pay the rent or the interest on their mortgage, and land development came to a standstill. But in some ways, they were far better off than the city slicker who'd lost his job. The farmers, at least, had a roof over their heads and a veggie patch and uh, an old orchard, a uh, few hens and a cow to milk, a gun and somewhere to use it. After 1935, things began to look up at last. But within four years, almost every able-bodied man was to find himself with a gun in his hands. History was repeating itself. For the second time in 25 years, the nation was sending thousands of its fittest young men to fight in a foreign war. Even the chief enemy was the same, Germany. But the war itself was different. It was a technological war, and it was fought in the air as much as on land and at sea. In the struggle for mastery of the skies, faster and deadlier aircraft were turned out in their thousands. Pilots were needed to fly them, and New Zealand provided its share. In 1945, the war ended. When the men came home, they brought with them some of the machinery of war. Back in New Zealand, there was still some unfinished business in the hills and on the pumice lands. Not every plane was a Spitfire or a Messerschmitt, though. There were also thousands of light trainers, like the Tiger Moth, and hundreds of New Zealanders learned to fly them. But when the war was over, both planes and pilots found themselves without a job to do, but not for very long. A squadron of Grumman Avengers was given a new and totally different task to see if fertilizer could be dropped accurately on farmland. If it worked here, on the runway at Ohakia, it would also work on the pastures in the hills. Aerial top dressing soon became a reality. At first, 
first they used scores of tiger moths left over from the war. But soon, New Zealanders were building aircraft especially designed for the job. Every morning, when the weather's suitable, 40 or 50 tons of superphosphate are dropped somewhere in New Zealand every minute. This shower of fertility falls from one end of the country to the other, but the downpour is heaviest on the rough hill country of the North Island. I suggested many years ago that the three-leaved white clover would be a more appropriate emblem for New Zealand than the silver fern, because white clover is really the key to the success of New Zealand's pastoral agriculture. That's virtually what the aerial top dressing industry exists for, to spread phosphate on the hills to make clover grow. And clover performs a very special job. It extracts nitrogen from the atmosphere and feeds it into the soil. That nitrogen, together with superphosphate and animal manures, provides the fertility that the better grasses like ryegrass need. Clover works all year round, year in, year out, for New Zealand farmers, putting millions of tons of free nitrogen into his soils. His competitors in North America and Europe have to use synthetic nitrogen made from petroleum, and that nitrogen costs them billions of dollars every year. By 1950, a dozen top dressing companies had been set up. It took more than a shower of fertilizer, though, to make the pumice land suitable for farming. There, the sickness of the soil had to be diagnosed before it could be cured. The diagnosis was made in 1935, but scientists didn't know how to apply the medicine for another 15 years when the age of aerial top dressing dawned. The answer to bush sickness was found almost by accident. On some farms, livestock did reasonably well, and scientists realized that all those farms had one thing in common. Salt licks were used on them to supplement the animal's feed. Quite by accident, those licks supplied an ingredient that no one had considered. Top dressing provided a way to administer the cure. If fertilizer could be spread on the pumice lands, so too could the vital trace element that animals needed to survive. Never in the history of New Zealand was so much land made so productive by so little. This is cobalt. It's a mineral that scientists found in certain iron licks for cattle. It was present only in minute quantities, but enough to prevent bush sickness. So that today, that's all you need in a whole ton of superphosphate. And diluting it in superphosphate enables it to be spread thinly and evenly because it only takes one handful for an acre, two handfuls or more for a hectare, and you've got bush sickness licked. There's no point in fertilizing scrub 
you've got to get rid of it. And that's where another legacy from the Second World War came in. Heavy machinery developed first as tanks and bulldozers was now used to uproot and crush scrub. It's a far, far cry from the heartbreak that followed the first attempts to tame the hills. But the completely new technology was only part of the story. This time, the government made sure the land they developed was suitable for farming. and they were more careful about who they put on to it. You had to have farming experience or gain farm qualifications. If you met all the requirements and if your name came up in the ballot, you were made. The Grateful Nation handed over a going concern, a farm complete with buildings, livestock, fences, top-dressed pastures, everything you needed, and they even lent you the money to buy it. The greatest hurdle was the ballot itself. Thirty years on, the men who were lucky in the ballot are thinking of retiring and of cashing in on their properties, some of them for as much as half a million dollars. Even the sheep find life easier on the hills these days. They've been specially bred for the hill country. This came about because of a landmark in farming education in New Zealand. Geoffrey Perrin was a man who, in 1927, became principal of Massey Agricultural College. Together with William Redet, he chose a site at Palmerston North for what would be the North Island's own agricultural college. In 1931, Lord Bledisloe performed the opening ceremony. Until then, the only agricultural college had been at Lincoln in the South Island, where conditions were very different. The new college quickly got down to business. Farmers told Perrin they were especially worried about the North Island's all-important breed of sheep, the Romney. He soon decided that a different breed was needed. What sparked Perrin's interest in a new breed of sheep was the fact that this Romney breed just couldn't cope with the hill country. It produced a heavy fleece, but farmers complained to Perrin that it just didn't produce enough lambs. And during the Great Depression, farmers needed every lamb they could get. So Perrin decided to cross the Romney with a tough hill country breed that produced many more lambs than the Romney and with far less shepherding. The hill breed that Perrin chose was the North Country Cheviot. You can recognize it by its clear white face and its light, fine, chalky fleece. It needed far less attention than the Romney. It's a small breed. This ram, in fact, is no bigger than these ewes. It was also a tough and a fertile breed. And by crossing the Cheviot with the Romney, Perrin managed to combine most of the advantages of the two breeds. A 
And here's the result. It took 25 years to establish this new breed, which, in honor of Sir Geoffrey, was called Perrandale. It's just what the hill country farmers needed. An easy care sheep that largely looks after itself and successfully weans more lambs than the Romney. Its fleece, though lighter in weight, is just as valuable as the Romney's because of its finer quality. It was some years, though, before this breed, the Perrandale, became available to farmers on the hills. It's on the hills that you can see what a useful breed the Perrandale is. Perrandales help the farmer keep his costs down. They're quick on their feet, easy to muster, easy to shift. And at lambing time, Perrandales can virtually be left to take care of themselves. But there were other new breeds. For example, at Lincoln College in Canterbury, they produced another Romney cross called the Coopworth. And the Romney itself was improved by very careful selection. Today, technology down on the farm is moving so fast that farmers find it difficult to keep up with all the new developments. It's not surprising, then, that the modern hill country man is only too keen to send his son and his daughter to Massey. When, in 1958, Sir Geoffrey Perrin retired after 31 years as principal at Massey, he left behind a fully-fledged university. Even so, Massey has retained much of the special vitality of an agricultural college, and it shows most clearly at Capping Town. When I was a student at Nottingham, we let off steam too, occasionally anyway. But in those days, we got a whole pint for sixpence. Now I suppose it would cost you more than 10 times as much as that. But people are a lot better off today, and their higher standard of living shows up in the most unlikely places. Just look at the floor of this bar room. Not the mess. That only happens once a year. I'm talking about the carpet underneath there. It was after the war that New Zealand began to manufacture carpet and found it could do the job as efficiently as any other country. There was one fly in the ointment, though. To give the carpet the hard-wearing qualities necessary, carpet manufacturers found that they had to import several million dollars' worth of a tough, hairy wool from Scotland and Yorkshire. They mixed it with the local Romney wool. Talk about shipping coals to Newcastle. But New Zealand simply didn't have a breed of sheep that produced a uniformly hairy wool. What it did have, though, was another import from Yorkshire, a gentle geneticist called Dry. Francis William Dry had been appointed to the staff by Perrin right from the start. Over the next 30 years, this shy, charming, and dedicated scientist became an institution on the campus. Perrin needed a geneticist to solve another major problem that was cropping up in Romney's sheep coarse, hairy fibers that spoilt the quality and uniformity of its fleece. It was a project that would occupy the scientist for many years. Dr. Dry spent hours and hours studying the coats of newborn lambs, as well as individual fibers from mature sheep. This is normal Romney wool. You can see it's fairly coarse and loosely crimped or wavy. But occasionally, some Romney ewes developed hair like this. It's very much coarser and straighter and detracted seriously from the value of Romney fleece wool. Dry was asked to find out what was the cause of this 
patchy hairiness and how to get rid of it. But one day, a farmer brought him a young Romney ram that had horns and coarse hairs almost all over its body. In fact, its entire fleece was like this. It was a throwback to the remote past of the breed, and it provided Dry with an absorbing subject for research. This is what the hairy wool looked like. It's long and straight and very coarse. Just compare it with ordinary Romney wool. To the consternation of local farmers and the embarrassment of the college, Dr. Dry bred up a whole flock of hairy sheep. For years, they were seen as only a scientific curiosity. But finally, in the 1960s, the penny dropped. Dr. Dry's sheep were producing a tough, pure white fleece that could replace those carpet wools we were importing all the way from England. The college and the carpet makers soon got together to exploit the new breed, which they were now pleased to call Drysdale. They established a strict monopoly breeding Drysdale rams. But you know how it is down on the farm. Rams and ram lambs occasionally get through fences. And in any case, new and other throwbacks, some of them superior to Dr. Dry's original ram, were cropping up, and rival breeds to the Drysdale were being established. The monopoly couldn't last. But New Zealand did have a new breed of sheep. It had a new type of wool for export, and New Zealand manufacturers had a new raw material. Perrindale is one of the best carpet wools, and with Drysdale to give it strength, New Zealand mills are producing some of the best carpets in the world. or who tread them in their homes or hotels realize how much they owe to the research done by the members of the original staff at Massey. But on the land, the farmer's more aware of what's being learned. He has to be. Every day he's faced with a multitude of choices. A wrong move at any time could cost him money which breeds, what rams, where and when to sell his products, which carrier to use and which lambs are ready for the works. Life for the hill country farmers today is far more hectic than it was for the men who first farmed the hills. The pioneers used to sell all their lambs at the annual fair held on the same day each year. When I first explored the North Island hill country on my honeymoon 40 years ago, it was still largely a wilderness of logs and stumps and of scrub and fern. In those days, polo was the preserve of maharajas and millionaires. Today, the successful rehab farmer is as much at home on the polo field as he is on his Japanese motorbike on the hills. Success for the rehab farmer means he can now rub shoulders with the local establishment. His wife's likely to be planning something a little more ambitious. The trip home she's always looked forward to. 
Harry and Bernice Fairweather spent 30 years developing a rehab farm in the hill country. In 1980, they sold it, and in retirement, they began to savor something of the sweetness of their success. On their world trip, they received what many New Zealanders would still consider the ultimate invitation. A garden party at Buckingham Palace may not be everyone's cup of tea. It does remind us, though, how far we've come since 1914, when those young men were withdrawn from the Battle of the Hills to fight instead for king and country. The sacrifices New Zealanders made for the empire in two world wars are well known. But the bitter price we paid in the battle for the hill country in places like Aotuhia is often completely overlooked. There have been some stunning failures along the way, something we're inclined to forget. Whole communities have been sacrificed, whole generations of pioneer farmers. They're the folk who knew nothing but the bitterness of failure. Today, we know how to tackle a country like this. What we lack is their determination. Perhaps for us, life has been just a little too sweet. But those early sacrifices do teach us a lesson, a valuable lesson. If we're going to tackle a country of this sort, we need to know precisely what we're taking on. Because in New Zealand, nature's a pretty aggressive sort of customer, and given half a chance, is bound to fight back. 